so I wanted to share with you what I think is like the larger takeaway from this example of like an educational technology. To me, what the most important lesson from this whole endeavor has been is that technology and by extension STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, these are disciplines that we tend to think of as like somewhat removed from culture. They're very abstract, right? They're pure. They're like above and beyond like cultural practices or cultural constraints. They're not like fuzzy things like literature or, hi or history, right? They're, they're these pure like abstract entities. But that way of thinking about STEM, particularly in the context of learning, um, particularly in the context of education, is just um, wrong-headed, I think. We need to um, acknowledge that STEM is a product of culture. Um, and it's completely situated in culture. And it's completely related to like who does it and kind of what counts um, as STEM like in our, in our communities, like what is celebrated and elevated as like as STEM. And I've been especially interested in the fact that there's all sorts of cultural practice, in particular all sorts of making practices and subcultures and communities out there where what they do is like just incredibly rich with STEM content and yet these, um, many of these subcultures are largely invisible to us as STEM. So they're not celebrated as STEM. We're not going out and saying like all kids should be doing crochet. I mean come on, it's a really important thing that all kids need to be engaged in like crocheting summer camp. But but crochet is like this spectacularly rich way to engage with STEM, with math, with algorithms, with geometry. Um, I'm not gonna make the specific argument for each of these images. Um, I've given other talks where I go kind of more in detail, but I want to just um, plant a seed here um, to get you to think about kind of each of these images as like, a practice, a cultural heritage that is like incredibly rich with STEM. Um, so up on the left, you have Grandmaster Flash, like the grandfather of hip hop, essentially, who hacked together like turntables to kind of develop an entirely new musical instrument. So brilliant engineer. Lowrider is kind of similar story. Uh, yeah, math, non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, I've talked a little bit about crochet. I'll kind of leave it there. But, but again, get back to like the takeaway message that so many cultures, cultural practices, so many different kind of subcultures um, do amazing kind of STEM stuff. And if we can connect to kids' cultures, to their history, um, to their identity, that's a wonderful way to get them interested and engaged. If they feel like, oh, actually, STEM is about me because I am interested in fashion or textiles or design. Like that's a tremendous way to get someone engaged in school or in STEM or kind of whatever it may be. In developing kind of learning technologies and working in kind of the learning space and the education space um, as a graduate student. Um, so where I started was, uh, trying to connect my interest and passion in kind of textile design and craft on the one hand, which has been kind of a lifelong interest with my interest in electronics and computation on the other hand. So I, I began to build these projects where those things were like mashed up um, into designs and into uh, installations and so on. So this is just one simple um, example, early project that I worked on. So this is a LED display that was stitched into a tank top. And you could program it to display different animated patterns and so on and so forth. You could play little games on it and stuff. Um, so I worked in this space some just as a designer, kind of playing around what, with what was possible. And I found it a really compelling, exciting, interesting space. And my next impulse was that I wanted more people to be having like the creative, expressive, like uh, engineering experiences that I was having. So I thought I should design a toolkit that would allow other people to make these kind of things. 
And so actually in 2007, um, the first commercial version of a toolkit, which, uh, which we called LilyPad Arduino, was released. And essentially it's a set of electronic pieces that you can sew into textiles. And so you connect them with this thread that's electrically uh, conductive, and so you can make electronics that are soft and flexible and washable, um, but have typical kind of interactive capabilities. So they're a little sewable, uh, there's a little sewable computer, a battery, um, and sensors like motion sensors and light sensors, temperature sensors, and then things like speakers and motors and LEDs. So you can make all sorts of stuff um, with a toolkit. Um, here's just uh, a close up to give you a sense of like how the pieces are connected, it's a conductive thread. And then once that kit was developed, um, my students and I also worked um, with uh, primarily a, a bunch of different middle and high school students and used this as a medium for introducing them to um, computation and electronics. And we found this to be like a really effective um, and compelling way to do that. So these are two um, middle school uh, girls with showing off like projects that they made in some of the workshops that we taught. So on the left, is a textile piano, so each of the colorful dots there, um, if you touch it, will play a different uh, musical note. And then on the right is a, a stuffed uh, interactive like monster, we call them, so you can squeeze its ears to get different, get it to play like different music, um, and its eyes can like blink in different patterns. The other exciting aspect of the project was to see just what people out in the world, all sorts of different kinds of people, um, were doing with the kit. So I'll show you now just this quick video of different projects that people made with the kit kind of early on in its beginning stages. you're used to. Right from right to left, each light is a stitch. Knit, yarn over, SSK, knit, 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 knit two together, yarn over. <laughs> things that I found most interesting and kind of compelling about this domain when I start, started um, to play in it was this juxtaposition of, of a, a typically kind of male-dominated field of electronics and computing with this typically kind of female-dominated field of textiles and fashion. Um, and by like mashing, mashing those things up, um, both kind of the physical mashing and the cultural mashing seemed really interesting and compelling to me. And so after the kit had been kind of out in the world for a few years, um, I decided to try to research if we were having, not only kind of helping people make interesting cool stuff, but if there were, were any cultural kind of impacts for doing that kind of mashup. 
And so um, with my colleague, uh, Mako Hill, who's now at the University of Seattle, um, we conducted a study where we looked at kind of a set of traditional electronics projects. So we went online and just collected a bunch of projects that were built with this more traditional electronics kit, the standard Arduino. Um, and then we went online and collected a bunch of projects that were made with the lily pad Arduino. Um, and I think the visual gives you a sense of some of like the different character of the two um, communities and the two kinds of projects. So the most striking um, outcome of that research, um, it's visualized here, um, so we found that in the traditional electronics community, about 2% of projects in general were, were done by women. Um, and in the lily pad Arduino community, um, that stat was kind of turned on its head. And a majority of projects, so about 65% of all the projects were done by women. I have uh, a son, he's three, he's awesome. This is us on a backpacking trip uh, last summer. Um, I wouldn't have known this before I had a kid, but it turns out like when you have a three-year-old, that's actually when you start to need to like think about where he's gonna go to elementary school, which seems like crazily early, but actually you have to plan that far in advance. Um, and so this year, I've been starting to try to tackle that problem. And like many parents across the country, when I've looked at that landscape, like all the options seem really problematic and kind of crappy to me. Um, and so I wanted to share some of that like frustration with you guys, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Um, so New Mexico, like many states, releases like a report card for all of the uh, uh, schools across the state. This is a report card for the school in my district um, where my son would go to school um, if we just like did the default thing. Um, yeah, so slightly alarming. Um, of course, this report card is based um, primarily on standardized test scores. Um, so you can see where that um, data comes from. So at this school um, where my son would potentially go, only about a third of kids were uh, met expectations, the terminology they, that they use for um, English and reading um, in third and fifth grade, and the numbers for math are like even way worse. So only like 10% of third graders and 5% of fifth graders like met expectations, like you know reached the basic milestones of like competency in math. Um, so I'm not a big proponent of standardized testing and it's kind of use um, to like measure student learning or teacher effectiveness or like the quality of a school. But I have to confess that these um, numbers give me pause. Um, and, and for better or for worse, this is essentially the only information that I have about this school. This is the only information about this school that's like made widely available to parents. Um, so this is what I've got to base my decision on. Um, and I'm scared. I'm not sure that this is where I want my son to ha be having his first um, experiences of like formal learning in an educational context. So yeah, that's option number one. Screen, yeah. Um, so I could send my kid to a private school. Um, this is one like seemingly fantastic option in town. So there's a beautiful, um, well-regarded uh, Montessori school. Um, uh, I have toured it, it's great. Um, it lives in this kind of old warehouse building that's like full of like amazing, beautiful light. Um, they have a garden and like chickens that they take care of um, out in the schoolyard. Um, there's an art gallery on the, the ground floor where they display like student art and also art from artists in the community. Everyone there seems just fantastic, engaged, thoughtful. Um, uh, seems like an all around wonderful place. Um, it costs um, 14K per year. Um, and I mean, this option to me is also not particularly appealing. It's a beautiful school, um, but it's also um, a really isolated, kind of beautiful bastion of privilege. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the experience I want my son to have, like growing up in the world um, for all sorts of reasons. I, I'm not particularly fond of this option either. 
Um, like um, many cities, Albuquerque, where I live, has also a number of um, charter schools um, that are available. Um, this is uh, one example. So there's a Montessori charter school, actually not too far from our house, um, that seems lovely. Um, the challenge, of course, with charter schools is that you have to apply to them through a lottery system. And there's like no guarantee that you will get into kind of the school that you're most interested in attending. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty involved involved in whether or not you can attend a charter school. So this seems like a good and potentially viable option, but also very nerve-wracking because it's in completely kind of uncertain. 